Hey, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Mark Sunlove. I'm the director of Soldiers Memorial, and uh, thank you for joining us today for yet another installment of our Chow and Chat series. Uh, this series happens every first and third Wednesday at noon. Uh, topics vary, uh, all kinds of different uh, historical issues, and then uh, like the one today, a little more practical use for uh, for yourselves at home. Um, but I wanted to, uh, to uh, kind of set the stage here a little bit. I want to thank you for attending. We're uh, we're virtual today, uh, as you all know. Uh, we started this series last year, about a year ago, and with the idea that we would gather around our boardroom table here at Soldiers Memorial and uh, a little uh, sharing of lunches and uh, in each other's company and, and some historical information. Of course, the world uh, did not have the same plans, and so here we are uh, presenting virtually. But thank you for taking the time out of your day to. Uh, to to come and spend some time with us. Um, I also uh, I want to uh, uh, thank people for being members of the Missouri Historical Society and of Soldiers Memorial. Uh, certainly your membership and your support is what make programs like this one and many other virtual uh, programs that the Missouri Historical Society is, is hosting um, throughout uh, every week. Usually two to three or sometimes even more virtual programs are available both through the Historical Society and through uh, Soldiers Memorial here. So, uh, so thank you for for you for you members and uh, for supporting us. And I'll I'll add some information in the uh, in the uh, in the chat box uh, as far as uh, if you're interested in becoming a member or providing some additional support. I also wanted to uh, thank sponsors, uh, Beelman Trucking Company. Uh, they uh, we asked for corporate sponsors for this program. Uh, last year, and uh, Beelman responded almost immediately and stepped up with a, a generous contribution to help us host this program along with other programs. And certainly, uh, I just uh, if you're anything like me, you've been you're doing a lot of shopping at home lately, and we're certainly grateful for uh, the truck drivers and the trucking companies that kind of keep things rolling across this country. So, thanks to uh, to Beelman for supporting us and supporting this program. Just a few details on how the program will run today. We're looking at about roughly 30 minutes uh, and then a 10 to 15 minute uh, question and answer ses session. You can submit questions uh, through the Q&A button in your toolbar that's down towards the bottom. Uh, and, and we will do our best to answer all questions, but we may not have time to get to, to all of them. Uh, Today's presentation is being recorded, so if you'd like to view it again or share it with others, uh, it'll soon be posted on our Missouri Historical Society YouTube, YouTube channel, and you'll be able to, uh, to do that. Uh, as always, your feedback is important to us. Uh, we would appreciate it if you could answer a few questions for us after the program. Uh, uh, what's called a Kobo Toolbox survey will soon pop up, will open in another tab in your browser following the presentation. So keep an eye out for that and please click on that and submit the uh, survey. We certainly appreciate it. But uh, today we have Kate Scott with us. Uh, Kate has been with Soldiers Memorial for three years, uh, taking on the incredibly important and incredibly difficult task of both inventory and cataloging and caring for the collections here at Soldiers Memorial that have accumulated over the past 80 years. Uh, so she's very comfortable in dealing with objects that need some tender loving care, that need some special consideration as far as storage and uh, potential display. Um, and uh, so she's going to teach you and, and let you know today how to kind of translate uh, the professional work that she does into your home. There are a lot of the same considerations that you would need to take into uh, into mind as you care for your own materials. Uh, Kate, uh, Kate uh, attended Illinois Wesleyan University uh, to get her bachelor's degree and followed that up with uh, attending Indiana University, Purdue, University of Indianapolis. Uh, and uh, following that, she worked a number of different contract positions, including for the Pulitzer Arts Foundation, um, ass assisting with her collections care and their archives, and then eventually came to Soldier's Memorial where she's been a, a, a great savior for us, taking care of our collections. Uh, and, and quite 
importantly, uh, to the St. Louisans in the audience, uh, Kate is a native St. Louisan growing up in Webster Groves and, and going high, to high school there at Webster Groves High School. So she is familiar uh, not only how to care for collections, but she's familiar with the unique uh, environmental conditions that a humid and sometimes hot St. Louis can pose to your, your items at home. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Kate and she will walk you through this. All right, well, hi everyone. Welcome um, again to how to care for your historical treasures at home. Um, if you are like me and my family, you are finding that right now is a great time to take a closer look at either your family heirlooms or maybe some other historic artifacts you have at home and really find the best way to either display them if you wanna have them out or um, the best way to store them so you can uh, keep them for a long time to come. So my hope is that this presentation will provide you with some good tips, excuse me, um, in case you're just quite not, not quite sure um, where to start with these projects. So before we talk about uh, what you should do for your treasures, um, I wanna address what can harm your treasures, uh, potentially cutting their life short, um, and then also preventing you from passing them down for generations to come. So there are seven major agents of deterioration that you uh, should be aware of, and I have them listed on the slide, but they are light, water, temperature, humidity, pests, uh, something we call inherent vice, which I'll explain a little bit more uh, later, and then also your storage materials. It matters um, what they're made of um, and the selections that you choose. So let's take a little bit clo a closer look at each of these. Uh, so the first um, agent of deterioration that can do a lot of harm to your treasures that you have at home is light. Um, it's very damaging, especially to light sensitive materials, which include textiles. And this damage, the damage caused by light is cumulative. So each successive exposure can cause further and further damage. And even if you have your artifacts out, um, on display in your home under less intense light. Um, if they're out for a long period of time, this can do just as much damage as if you had them out um, under more intense light for a short period of time. So it's kind of something to keep in mind um, when you're deciding whether you want to put it out on a shelf in your home or whether you want to kind of store it away. Um, light can cause uh, lots different types of damage, um, fading of color in textiles, yellowing of your family photos um, or documents, objects can become brittle, um, and even the fibers and textiles can become weakened and then that leads to tears um, and other damage. Um, and this type of uh, damage cannot be reversed. You can't put the color back into a textile once you've lost it. Um, so light is one that can do severe permanent damage. Um, and you can kind of see this on the screen here. I have images of two jackets from our collection. The one on the bottom um, had been a bit overexposed to light. Um, and so it was originally the color um, of the jacket on top. So that kind of familiar uh, green, but now it has turned brown uh, due, to, due to light exposure. So temperature and relative humidity are very closely linked together and they can be incredibly damaging to your artifacts. Swings in both temperature and relative humidity can cause the, uh, your artifacts or the materials they're made of to expand and contract. And over time, expanding and contracting and expanding and contracting can cause a lot of damage, either cracks or other, um, other problems with your treasures. And if the RH becomes too high, um, then you can get damp conditions. And this is a prime um, breeding ground for mold and mildew, which can be a big um, issue to tackle. Um, and so you want to avoid um, getting your RH too high, your temperature too high um, in your home. If you can find a place where the temperature in RH stays rather consistent, this is the best place to store your artifacts. 
Um, and then you can kind of see in this photo here um, on the lower left, we have this boot um, that unfortunately was um, mold and mildew brew on it because it was in a damp, um, in a damp storage area. And so um, once it gets to a certain point, it, um, it can eat away at the materials um, and do further damage to your, to your treasures. And then on the other side of the spectrum, um, if it's not too high, if your RH gets too low, you can also dry out your materials. This is especially relevant to wood and leather items. Um, if they get too dry, they can start to crack um, and they can also uh, start to uh, warp. So you wanna also avoid um, getting your RH and temperature too low in your house. Um, and then water um, is kind of a beast of its own. It can fully damage some treasures, um, especially family photographs, uh, any paper documents you might have. And then even if a document or a photo isn't totally destroyed, uh, it still can be severely damaged even through the drying process. So I have images of that up here on the top, um, a photograph, and then a reported, a missing document, um, you can see that they got wet, they were dried, but uh, their damage has been left, left behind because of this. And then pests. So pests like these can do a lot of damage to your treasures as well. Um, I have a couple here on the screen the varied carpet beetle, which is this guy um, here on the, on the bottom. Uh, and then we have the webbing clothes moth, and then the silver fish, which is my least favorite. Um, <laughs> but these guys can do wreak all kinds of havoc with your treasure. The varied carpet beetle and the moth uh, like to go after anything with wool on it, feathers, hair, fur, leather and silk fabrics. Um, mice can also get into your treasures, um, especially if they don't really have anything else to go after. Um, they, will, um, they will get into your other things. And then uh, the silverfish, especially like paper products um, and textiles, they can do so much damage. They'll eat through pages of books and just rip them to shreds. Um, and so these are, um, these are ones you really wanna be on the lookout for. Um, so keep an eye out if you are storing your items away, kind of out of sight, out of mind. Check on them every now and then and make sure that pests like these haven't gotten to them. If you know that you've had a problem in an area of your home in the past, maybe avoid storing items there. Um, or if you just want to be proactive and monitor for um, uh, pests like these uh, because you have incredibly valuable treasures, um, that you want to be able to pass down for generation, from generation to generation, um, then you can go um, buy some sticky traps and kind of monitor that way. That's a great um, way to kind of keep an eye on things without um, doing further damage to your treasures with a more harmful kind of um, mitigation. So, and if you find uh, pests in your treasures that are not one of the ones I've mentioned, um, there's actually a great website called museumpests.net. Um, and they have an identification tab on the top of their website. And they have all of these uh, pest fact sheets. So if this is something um, that you're more curious about and you wanna look into further um, and do a little investigating, if you happen to find things in your home, um, then that's a great resource. And then if things get too out of hand, um, you can always consult a professional company. So inherent vice. This is an agent, uh, so in addition to the agents of deterioration that we've been talking about, light, relative humidity, um, inherent vice is when items deteriorate just because of the way they were made. Um, either because of poor construction or unstable materials. So uh, there are three types um, of inherent vice. The first is short-lived materials. Um, and a great example of this is wood pulp paper, um, which is what newspapers are made out of. 
and um, they, they're, these are materials are just simply not meant to, to last. It's the way they were manufactured. They just, they don't hold up over time. The second type of inherent vice is structural nature. So uh, this is poor design or construction. Um, so an example might be loose joints or buckling of supports over time. Um, just because they weren't meant, they, they were poorly constructed to begin with, and so they, they just didn't hold up. Um, and then the last type of inherent vice is history. How an item was stored, used, and or treated before you acquired it. So then storage and display materials. How an item is stored uh, can actually also result in damage to your treasures. Um, and this is something that you wanna be really aware of. Um, there are quite a few materials you should avoid when choosing storage materials for your treasures. Um, and I've list listed some here. Um, scrapbooks, mats, and storage boxes made of acidic paper or board, um, you definitely wanna avoid. This includes uh, those magnetic albums. I know my grandma used to use those um, for almost all of her uh, scrapbooks that she put together, but these can actually do a lot of damage even when you think they're protecting your treasures. Um, the photos um, that you put on the pages can actually be stained by the adhesive that makes the pages stick. Um, and also the documents or the photographs that you put on them over time can become hard if almost not impossible to remove. Um, and if you are able to remove them, um, you might do damage in this, to them in this process. So I have an example here on the screen of a document attached to one of these magnetic pages. Um, it will probably stay this way. It will never come off. Um, it is adhered to that page um, very well. Um, the other, um, the other item that you should avoid is cardboard. Um, it's acidic and it can lead to deterioration of your treasures um, if you use um, it as a storage material. So no cardboard boxes or anything like that. Glue, tape, and other adhesives are also um, something that you want to avoid. Um, they're hard to remove. Again, and if you can, um, you may damage your treasures in the process of trying to remove the adhesive. Um, so never use an adhesive in direct contact uh, with any of your items. Rubber bands um, are also one you want to avoid. They can discolor your photos um, and they also fall apart over time. So they're just not a good, um, they're not a good choice. Paper clips are also one you want to avoid. Uh, they can dent your photos. And um, so even if they say that they're rust free, don't use them because of the dents. Uh, but then if they do rust, they can also stain your photographs or documents. And then sticky notes also um, want to avoid those. There are other ways, better ways to label your photos and or documents if you want to do that. Um, but the, uh, adhesive on the sticky note can also uh, stain your, your items. Okay, so now that we have talked a lot about what you shouldn't do, let's talk about what you should do. So at the very base level, um, you want to store and or display your items out of direct sunlight. As we talked about earlier, light is incredibly damaged, damaging to your treasures and daylight is actually the most damaging. So um, you want to avoid that. Also, storing things off the floor and away from any walls is a great, um, is a great place to start. Um, this prevents any water damage in case you have leaks, especially if you're storing items in your basement. Um, and then also, keeping things away from the exterior walls in your house can help with uh, temperature and relative humidity reg uh, regulation um, and consistency. So you'll get that benefit as well. And then you want to use appropriate acid-free materials. So I don't know if any of you have textiles um, in your home that you're looking to preserve, um, whether that be a wedding dress, maybe a baptism outfit, or even old baby clothes. Um, 
I know my mom has quite a few of these items at home that she's been looking to, to store away um, in the best way possible. So if you do have textiles, um, the best way to preserve them is by storing them in an acid-free box, um, flat. Uh, you don't want to, uh, and then if you, you don't want to fold them um, if you can help it. So buying a box that's big enough for the item that you're trying to store um, so you don't have to fold it um, is the best. But if you do fold it, use as few folds as possible and then pad those folds with acid-free unbuffered tissue. Um, because when you fold, it causes creases and then with enough time, if it stays like that, those creases can actually start to tear. So that's something that you want to avoid. Um, if possible, try not to hang your textiles. I know that hanging them in a closet can be sometimes the easiest um, and most convenient way for people to, to store these items, but um, hanging them on hangers uh, puts undue stress on the shoulder seams and also the neck of the garment. So first choice is definitely flat in a box. Um, but if you do um, want to hang them or need to hang them, and this is the best method for you, then definitely use padded hangers. You can actually use batting and muslin to create your own um, at home. And that's what we do here at the museum. We make our own padded hangers. So I have examples on the screen of those. Um, we use uh, a quilted composite and some polyester batting to make um, the, any hangers for tops and dresses. And then we use a cotton tubing, sometimes called stockinette, and polyester batting to pad out our pants hanger. Um, but you can use a simple polyester batting and you can get 100% cotton muslin um, simply from Joanne Fabrics. That'll do, that'll do the trick. And then here is another, on the, the other photo on the screen is an example of the textile boxes that we use here when we do need to store something flat. All right, and then um, the family photos and documents are what you're looking to preserve. Um, I also have some basic guidelines for that. If you are looking to display any of these items um, and you wanna frame them, uh, you should always make sure that the framer is using acid-free materials when they make the mat. Um, and they should also not be using any types of conventional tape or glue. If you are um, a local and you live here in St. Louis, the businesses on the screen that I've listed are great um, options for you. Um, all of these services provide museum quality framing. And then you always wanna handle photographs by their edges. Um, it's a simple one, but fingerprints can do a lot of damage to the surface of your photos. So always be conscious of that. Um, and then if you want to label your photos um, you, with the names and dates, uh, with names, dates, or locations, um, you can certainly do that. You can do it right on the back using a pencil. Never use a marker or a pen. And use as little, uh, as light of a touch as possible so that you don't get an impression on the other side. Um, but this is the best way to do that. No, uh, no adhesive sticky labels or sticky notes like we talked about before. And if you're not going to display your documents or photographs, uh, you want to store them in an acid-free or an, an acid-free and lignin-free folder or box. Those are the key words that you want to look for when you are purchasing um, items to store your uh, paper or photographs in. Uh, most of the, I'm sorry, the uh, places that I've listed at the very bottom of the screen are all reputable archival vendors that we do use to get materials um, at the museum here. Um, and so uh, those have great resources for you. And if you are going on their website and you click on a folder or a box, it should very clearly say in the description that it is acid-free and lignin-free. So it should be easy for you to decipher whether it's gonna be a good choice. And then if you are storing photographs specifically, you also want to make sure that the items you're choosing have passed the photographic activity test or, or PAT. 
Um, and this test simply means that the materials have been tested and it is proven that they will not interact poorly with the photographic image. So that won't do any damage at all. Um, and if you're looking at the descriptions on these archival vendor websites, it will also very clearly say that it has passed the PAT test. Um, let's see. And I have put two examples on the screen here of kind of the way we do it. We use these um, the boxes shown and then a larger folder um, to put our photographs in. And then we either put the photographs in individual uh, mylar sleeves or we will interleave them um, with a special acid-free paper to make sure that the photographs are not rubbing up against each other. But there are a myriad of ways that you can do this. Uh, they have individual paper envelopes on these sites that you can buy. So you could put each photograph in a paper envelope and then if you wanted to, you could label the outside of that envelope uh, with more information about the photo. They have um, kind of boxes with separated compartments. So if you have smaller, a lot of smaller photographs, that might be a good option for you. Um, so many options, so many ways you can do it. Um, that fits best for you. But again, you wanna look for acid-free and lignin-free if you're buying any boxes or folders. And then if you are gonna use scrapbooks or photo albums, I know a lot of people love to um, gather their photographs that way. Um, you still wanna purchase these supplies from a reputable archival vendor. Um, the ones below also do sell albums and scrapbooks that have passed the PAT test. Um, and so, uh, you want to look for those instead of going with a magnetic album or just um, any old scrapbook, maybe from the store. Um, and then you can use photo corners to attach the photos to those pages. Um, that way you're not putting any sort of adhesive directly on, on your photographs. All right, and then lastly, um, if you have, um, if you're interested and you have more that you wanna do and you're specifically looking at working with your photographs at home, you should check out this video from our Historians at Home series that our objects conservator, Krista Pack, did a little while ago. She does a phenomenal kind of step-by-step -step, um, process of uh, how you should take care of your family photographs. So you can check that out on our YouTube page or Facebook page. All right, that's all I have. Are there questions? We have a couple of questions, Kate, that have come in so far. I think one you, you covered fairly well, actually. The, I think it came in before that, that particular slide, but was asking what good and affordable source for acid-free storage materials. But you, you seem to cover that um, uh, fairly well. So I don't know yeah. if there's any more you'd like to add to that or, um, um, so those are great places to start. I recommend starting there um, because they definitely are reputable um, and you know what you're getting. Um, they can be expensive though. So if you are going to venture out um, away from those, again, just look diligently for that acid-free and lignin-free kind of stamp of approval. And the, uh, the second question we got, Kate, was, a, I think, a great question because I, I was actually just dealing with some of this myself, and okay. I, I, didn't, I didn't get too far in the process, but I uh, was asking about printing photographs and uh, when printing photos, you know, because, of course, most photos nowadays are born digital. Um, right. Do you, can you provide any considerations? Are there commercial services that offer good ink, inks and papers, or do you know... Uh, you know, maybe good questions you should be asking or looking for as you pursue those services? Hmm. That's a great question. I think that one maybe we'll, we'll have to... Uh, I might have to get back to you back, um, if yeah. I can. Um, I can do a little digging and research. We don't... Um, a lot of the stuff we do is digital or we print it for exhibits. Um, so it's on kind of sturdier stuff. Um, but for at home, that's a little bit of a different situation. So let me do a little research. Yeah. I would just add to that conversation, uh, kind of the reverse of that too. You know, there's, of course, you did a great job of covering the physical preservation of the photograph itself. But then there's also services now uh, that are available um, where 
you know, corporations or companies will actually digitize uh, the photos that you do have. So um, that obviously doesn't save the physical uh, material as we were discussing, but it does save uh, the image. And those, um, you know, they're, they're commercial uh, companies now that are engaged in that business of digitizing photographs. And that's another thing to look out for. Absolutely. And Krista covers that in her video as well, that, you know, if you have particular photos, I mean, obviously you can do all of them if you want, but if there are certain ones that you really, really want to hang on to that maybe have already degraded a little bit, digitizing them is a perfect um, avenue to making sure that if the physical copy doesn't stay around, you still have that photo. Yeah. And uh, one more uh, question, Kate. Do you have uh, any recommendations on... Um, uh, I'm sorry, with slides. Of course, a lot of people have photographs that are in slides and they present yeah. a whole different um, range of challenges and things to consider. Uh, do you have anything you can add uh, to that conversation? I have not personally worked with slides, um, but I know that Gaylord and the other archival um, places offer specific boxes made to house slides. So that might be something that you want to look into. Um, in terms of anything that can, anything particular to slides that you want to kind of protect or look out for, I don't know off the top of my head, but I can again do a little more reading on that and get back to the person. Yeah, and, and I think what you had said earlier is probably the key for a lot of this stuff, Kate, and that's, uh, is that, uh, you're trying to avoid acid material. So you're really looking for these acid-free and lignin-free storage boxes, which I, you just said that Gaylord offers boxes that are specifically made for for handling slides. Yeah, I think the other, there are a couple, um, some, couple of the companies have that, but they get, they have pretty much boxes for everything. If you're a coin collector, they have boxes made to house your coins and, and all of that. Um, it seems like acid is the big boogeyman here. Acid is the big boogeyman. <laughs> when it comes to anything that's uh, got a photo or an art, a, a piece of paper or, or whatever, um, if it comes in contact with a lot of acid, other acid materials, you're going to get some damage. You're going to get some damage. Yeah. So my, my size 12 shoe box is not the ideal place to have my family photos. Is, that's what you're saying, Kate? Right, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Although... Although I may or may not have a shoebox of my own that I need to be on. <laughs> Who doesn't, right? There's a certain joy in opening up the, uh, the shoebox and going through the old photos. But there is. a shoebox could very easily be an acid-free box as well. Mm. Let me check one more time for, uh, see if we got questions here. I think that's all we have today, Kate. Um, okay, um, and then just real quick, I wanted to add, um, I know I talked about padding your own hangers um, and um, item, things like that. Um, just a quick addition, if you do hang your um, textiles, um, you can also make a garment bag to go over it to protect from dust and light. Um, and the National Park Service actually puts out these really cool um, conservograms and they're little one-pagers. Um, for either museum professionals or people who are just kind of going it alone at home. Um, and there's one that has step-by-step -step instructions on how to make garment bags or hangers. So you can always kind of look there and maybe some of the other conservograms might um, inspire you or have good tips that you, for your questions. I'm gonna drop that link here in the, uh, in the chat box real quick. Uh, okay. I can navigate this well enough. See, here we go. And that's the uh, MPS conservograms, they call them. Yeah, I, I find them really handy. They're nice little, quick little reads. So if this is stuff that you're really interested in, it's a good, it's a good resource. Well, thank you very much, Kate. I know we all we all have a lot of unexpected time at home right now, and uh, yep. I think taking care of some of these projects at home that will ensure the the life of our treasures and that we can pass them down to others and and keep them to show others. Um, these are all great tips, and definitely appreciate your time. Absolutely, no problem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, the next uh, challenge chat uh, is going to be, thanks for tuning in today. The next challenge chat is going to be uh, September 16th. Uh, like I said earlier, we, we host these every first and third Wednesday at noon uh, of each month. Uh, so the, the second one this month, month will be September 16th. Uh, and our military and firearms curator, Michael Benso will be talking about an entirely different subject, and that is Gold Star Mothers, um, a, a group of ladies who are certainly very near and dear to our heart, uh, those who have lost loved ones, uh, you know, a son or a daughter in conflict. So Mike will be providing a little bit of history of uh, that organization and, and those individuals, and, and then also uh, we hope to line up a couple uh, gold star mothers to actually uh, speak with and, and kind of be interviewed by Mike. So certainly uh, some people who are more than deserving of our time and, and attention. So we look forward to that second one uh, this month. Um, to, if you're interested in supporting the programs, you can see the link there. And then the, there's a brief survey that just asks you how we did today and maybe uh, give us some pointers and maybe some direction for future challenge chats of what you might be interested in. So thanks again uh, very much uh, for your time and enjoy the rest of your uh, day. And please keep yourself safe and, and keep each, of, each other uh, safe out there. Thank you very much.